Welcome to UO Today. I'm Barbara Altman, sitting in for Steve Shankman, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest today is Joseph Cirincioni, the president of the Ch Plowshares Fund and a guest lecturer brought to the University of Oregon by the Political Science Department and the Humanities Center. Joseph Cirincioni earned his B.A. at Boston College and his master's from the Georgetown School of Foreign Service. He previously served as the Senior Vice President for National Security and International Policy at the Center for American Progress and as Director for Nonproliferation at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Prior to that, he was a staff member of U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Armed Services and Committee on Government Operations. In addition to his work at Plowshares Fund, he also teaches at the Georgetown University Graduate School of Foreign Service. He is the author of numerous articles on weapons of mass destruction. His most recent book is Bomb Scare, The History and Future of Nuclear Weapons, published in 2007. Welcome. Thank you, Barbara. As we were just discussing, you're a very busy man. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, it's a, it's a hot issue, and there's a lot of interest in not only what our current policies are, but what they might be. So I, I get to talk a lot about this. Well, I hope we can talk about both pieces of those, what they currently are, and where you think we might be headed. The topic of your uh, speech here on campus is the collapse of the Bush Doctrine, the next nuclear strategy. Yes. So maybe let's start by looking ahead, if you will. I understand that you believe that the next strategy will be to abolish nuclear weapons. Is that fair to say? I, I do think that the, the odds are that uh, the next president of the United States is going to take the goal of eliminating nuclear weapons much more seriously than uh, the, the past two or three presidents have. You really have to go back to the Truman or Kennedy years what, to see the kind of high-level interest uh, in, in abolishing nuclear weapons or, as we now are discovering, the years of Ronald Reagan when he personally believed that we should abolish nuclear weapons although that never became a government-wide priority. The interesting thing that people might not know is that both of the major candidates, uh, Barack Obama, who's not yet the Democratic candidate but likely will be, and John McCain have both issued statements embracing the goal of the elimination of nuclear weapons. And John McCain said he would lead a global campaign to, uh, for nuclear disarmament. Now, I haven't heard a Republican candidate say that in a very, very long time. When John McCain's talking like that, you know something's going on. So you think whether it's the Republicans or the Democrats who are in charge of the next White House, um, we're likely headed in this direction? I think a consensus is building that it's in the national security interest of the United States to live in a world free of nuclear weapons. These are the only weapons that can destroy us as a nation. There are some 26,000 nuclear weapons still in the world, most of them in the stockpiles of the United States and the Soviet, and sorry, of Russia. But, mm -hmm. but some possessed by other countries and some at risk of falling into terrorist hands. So the, 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 the consensus is building that our goal should be to move towards their elimination, reducing stockpiles, reducing the amount of material. Uh, it's encouraging to me to hear John McCain embrace that. I believe Barack Obama has the more developed plan, at least so far. He spelt it out in a, in a, a speech and position papers and he sponsored legislation with Chuck Hagel, the Hagel-Obama legislation. Chuck Hagel's the, Demo the Republican senator from Nebraska, yeah. laying out an eight-part program for how we would move towards reducing these nuclear risks and eventually eliminating weapons. So Obama's got the more developed um, uh, program, and he seems to ha his advisors seem to be moving m more consistently in that direction. There was an interesting article by Evo Dalder, who heads his nonproliferation team, and John Holum, who's one of his key advisors, saying that the el elimination of nuclear weapons should be the organizing principle of the next president's nuclear policy. I think that's exactly right. So I'm, I'm, I'd be, I'm encouraged to hear uh, people in both parties talking like this. The elimination of nuclear weapons is one piece of it, but I gather another piece of it is the containment of the materials that are used for the building of nuclear weapons. The number one national security threat to the United States is nuclear terrorism. Mm -hmm. There's really no question about that. There are many risks we face, but a nuclear 9-11 would be a catastrophe unlike anything we've ever seen. And we're now in a situation where Osama bin Laden may be closer to getting a nuclear weapon than he ever has been. 
ever since we, we nearly uh, captured him at Tora Bora, but let him get away, he's consolidated bases again in Pakistan. So you have to understand this. Osama bin Laden, the leader of al-Qaeda, the people who attacked us on 9-11, are, are stronger now, or at least as strong as they were before 9-11, have new training camps in Pakistan, a country that has enough material for between 50 and 100 nuclear weapons, has strong Islamic fundamentalist influences in its military and intelligence services, has an unstable government, and now Osama bin Laden. If something were to happen to the government of Pakistan, if there were to be an insurgency, if the government were to split, the question is who gets the weapons? Who gets the material to build the weapons? Who gets the scientists who know how to build the weapon? I, I am very worried that Osama bin Laden could uh, use chaos in Pakistan to get the weapon he, he desires. And if he were able to do that, it's a fairly simple matter to transport it to the United States, simpler still to detonate it. The task of the next president of the United States has got to be to prevent that from happening by securing and eliminating these nuclear materials wherever they are. Pakistan's at the top of my list, but so are materials stored in insecure conditions in the states of the former Soviet Union and some 40 other countries who have nuclear materials that could be used for a nuclear bomb. We have programs that know how to secure them, know how to eliminate them, but they've been operating at a snail's pace. It's time to step it up. In a recent um, book review that you had in the uh, New York Review of Books in which you address four recent publications on this topic, you go back a little bit to the era of President Reagan and Gorbachev and how close they actually came yeah. to something of the sort. Could you talk about that a bit and tell us why we're discovering that now, 25 years later? I, I don't think people realize how serious Ronald Reagan was about eliminating nuclear weapons. People remember his Star Wars speech mm -hmm. where he launched the Strategic Defense Initiative, the anti-missile programs, and he talked about making nuclear weapons impotent and obsolete. Well, it turns out he really meant it. And in 1987, when he had the, the summit with Mikhail Gorbachev in Reykjavik, Iceland, he, the transcripts of which are now available, Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev had serious, detailed, personal conversations, and they came very close to agreeing to a new treaty to eliminate all nuclear weapons within 10 years. The stumbling block was the SDI program, the, the Star Wars program. Gorbachev wanted it combined to a laboratory for those 10 years. Reagan was insistent that he be allowed to go ahead. He was more optimistic about the chances of developing an anti-missile shield, and he saw that as integral to his vision. In a world of very few nuclear weapons, he wanted to have an insurance policy. The deal stumbled over that agreement. Um, but some of his advisors who were with him, George Schultz, shared Ronald Reagan's visit, uh, vision. And I think we're now seeing George Schultz rekindle this Reagan effort to eliminate nuclear weapons with a, with a, a new effort that he started with Henry Kissinger, mm -hmm. Sam Nunn, and um, William Perry, so two Republicans two Democrats joining to campaign for a world free of nuclear weapons. In effect, we're seeing the fusion of this, this Reagan vision of elimination with the Kennedy vision of the abolition of nuclear weapons that inspired a previous generation. It's a, it's a remarkable phenomenon that's happening still largely out of, out of view of the American public, but one I think we're going to hear a lot more of in the coming years. At, um, at the time of these discussions between Reagan and Gorbachev, George Shultz was Secretary of State, is that right? And so yes. we've got, a, we've got a, a turnaround. What was happening a generation ago is surfacing again in a yes. slightly different way. Yeah. I gather you think that this, this time around it's much more broad-based. It is. It's, uh, you know, Reagan couldn't carry it off, and he was, some of his own advisors uh, opposed him at the time. George Shultz supported him and, and still does now. But what we're seeing is as, uh, largely as a result of, of several things. One, the continuing and growing nuclear dangers. Two, the collapse of the current strategy, the, the Bush doctrine that sought to overthrow regimes as a way of eliminating nuclear weapons programs. But three, the emergence of this um, consensus, uh, not from the left. This is not the nuclear freeze movement where people are demonstrating in the street. This is from the moderate middle. This is from card-carrying cold warriors. I mean, Schultz, Kissinger, Nunn, Perry. When these guys, people who were responsible for 
building up the nuclear establishment, for funding and justifying this nuclear weapons complex, now say that their invention is obsolete and should be eliminated, people listen. And in fact, their fellow former officials are listening. They've got the endorsement now of many of the former secretaries of state, secretaries of defense, and national security advisors. Seventeen of the still living 24 people who have served in those cabinet posts now embrace the vision of eliminating nuclear weapons. I'm talking about Jim Baker, Colin Powell, Melvin Laird, Frank Carlucci, Bud McFarlane. Have I mentioned a Democrat yet? I mean, you, what you see is the really the, the elite of the national security establishment quietly but, but steadily coalescing around this view that nuclear weapons are no longer in the national security interest of the United States. We're a ways uh, away from that. We're, we're working towards it. There's a broad-based coalition. It's coming from a, a much broader platform. But in the meantime, President Bush is asking for 12 make billion sure and get dollars. My, get my decimals right. Yes, 12 I know. It's hard billion to keep track dollar of all this. appropriation in order to perpetuate the research that has been going on. Well, the part of the policy that's failed, I think, is the view that nuclear weapons are still central to our strategy, so therefore we need to keep thousands of them, and that the way we will protect ourselves is by building an anti-missile shield. It's a nice word, a shield, you know, inspires a kind of hope that we can keep these weapons, but we can shoot down anybody's attempt to, to harm us with mm -hmm. these weapons. And President Bush is now asking Congress for $12 billion in this year's budget. And this that is, would be $60 billion over the next five years, yes. correct? Yes, and yeah. so extending out yeah. $60 billion. In fact, the Congressional Budget Office estimates that if the plans that we now have were to be carried out, it would cost us about $250 billion to build all the systems they, they want to build, an enormous uh, a, amount of money, and especially when you consider that none of these systems have proven to work yet. May I quote something that you said um, in testimony before uh -oh. the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Oversight and uh, Government Reform Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs. Yeah, the subcommittee I this used to work for, I'm now testifying Now before. you're testifying. This was, I believe, on April 30th of this year, and yeah. on the web we found the written version of your testimony. You had a great sentence on the topic of anti-missile programs. You said, quote, instead of soaring performance, we have a record unblemished by success, unquote. That's you stand by that. I do stand by that. You know, we're we're getting sold a bill of goods by uh, some of the proponents of these systems. Uh, they've de conducted a series of demonstrations where they are able to hit a bullet with a bullet. That is, they shoot up a target at a predetermined point in space, and we are remarkably able to intercept it at that same space. But this is much more like two missiles hitting each other. The way these things are so carefully choreographed. What they've never done is tested against the kind of target we actually would be likely to encounter in the real world. That is a target that's not cooperating with this, that we don't know exactly what it looks like. We don't know what, what, its, what its vectors are going to be. And that is accompanied by decoys, very simple, cheap countermeasures, balloons that could be inflated to, to look identical to the warhead, cheap one-watt jammers that could be floated out to give a signal out that would blind our radar. Very easy things to do that our intelligence services believe any country that could launch an ICBM could put up these countermeasures. We've never tested an intercept shot against, against one of those. And, and for that reason, I, I believe that, that all of the tests so far have been staged. Some people say rigged, but it's more like these are demonstration shots, and we've never successfully uh, intercepted a, a realistic target. Uh, yet, the money keeps flowing, the systems are now being deployed, even though they, they are not proven to work, and I believe the Bush administration is, is rushing in its last few months in office to try to create facts on the ground, to pour concrete, to bend metal, to make it more difficult for the uh, next president to reverse course. I understand that one of the major factors behind this determination to keep spending billions of dollars on the development of these systems is what you call threat inflation. Yes. Could you talk about threat inflation and explain why that's such a powerful force? Sure. That's the, the conscious effort by 
our officials to exaggerate the threat in order to get the Congress and the American public to support programs or wars that they otherwise wouldn't support. The classic example of this is now the build-up to the Iraq War. In fact, the last time I was here at the university was the month before we launched the Iraq War, and I was here arguing that the threat was not as severe as the administration was claiming, that we had Saddam in an iron cage surrounded by troops with the hundreds of inspectors on the ground looking for programs and finding none, that we had time to wait to let the inspections run its course, but you had officials at the time claiming that he had restarted a nuclear program, that he had tons of chemical weapons, that he had tons of biological agent that we had to strike before it was too late. Classic case of threat inflation. It wasn't the only time we've done that. Part of the New York Review of Books article that you, you, you cite uh, was a review of Richard Rhodes' wonderful new book called Arsenals of Folly, and he traces the modern history of threat inflation back to NSC 68, the, the National Security Memorandum uh, written by Paul Nitzan and then, then uh, Dean Acheson, a senior official in the Truman administration, that intentionally, not, we're not talking about an honest disagreement, that intentionally inflated the then Soviet threat, in Dean Acheson's words, to be a bludgeon on the mass mind of government. They were trying to push the bureaucracy to increase defense spending to undertake programs that they otherwise wouldn't take. We see this technique happening time and time again in our government. We see some people doing it now with Iran, taking a serious threat, a real threat, but inflating it to almost grotesque proportions to try to convince us that Iran's the new Nazi Germany, that President Ahmadinejad is the new Hitler, that unless we take action, and by that they mean military action, we will regret it. We will somehow suffer severe national security consequences. That's why it's important for the public, for, for students, to be watching these developments, making their own analysis, questioning the statements they're hearing from government officials, just as our founders intended. You've laid out the, the idea we're being fed about the scariest possible scenario in Iran at the moment. Could you offer an alternative um, assessment of what's actually going on in so, Iran? Uh, Iran is I think a threat to, to, the, to its neighbors and to the United States uh, to, and to Israel above all. This, these, these are serious challenges here. You have to keep it in perspective. Fin uh, Iran has a gross domestic product uh, approximately that of Finland's. After natural gas and oil, its chief exports are carpets, dates, and pistachios. We, on the other hand, are the most powerful country the world has ever seen. We're the ones with an international alliance system and military bases all around Iran. We're the ones who have strong relations, even with Iran's closest allies, like Russia, for example. We're the ones who have all the, all the cards. If we're smart enough to play them right, I think we can put Iran in a corner and then, here's the key, give them a way out. Open a door that gives them a path to satisfy their genuine security and, and regional aspirations in a non-nuclear, non-military way. And here's the good news. There's a growing consensus among people, I would say outside this administration, that that's exactly the path we have to take. Both the Iraq Study Group, headed up by Jim Baker and Lee Hamilton, found this to be the case when they made their recommendations almost two years ago. And the new national intelligence estimate on Iran issued in November said, and this is almost a direct quote, some combination of pressures and incentives can convince Iran that it can reach its security, prestige, and regional goals through a non-nuclear path. I think that's exactly the way to approach Iran, to understand that we have to have a comprehensive and balanced approach. And if we take that kind of path, I think it's, we can walk I I Iran back. We can convince them to give up their program just the way we convinced Libya to give up its nuclear program and the way we're beginning to convince North Korea to give up its program. The key word there might be diplomacy, and we'll get back to that in just a moment, if you don't mind. I wanted to look back quickly to some of the suggestions you made in the testimony before the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign yeah. Affairs. Um, the, your five 
suggestions in the section called New Approach were dissolve the National Missile Defense Agency. Yes. That was the first. Second was restore normal test and procurement procedures. Third was produce an integrated objective threat assessment, I gather, to counter the threat inflation. Yes. Fourth was commission an independent technological assessment. And the fifth was to restore fiscal discipline. Yes. Um, those sound now as though they may be interim measures as we wait for a new administration to work on something more comprehensive? Well, s some of that the Congress can implement now. For example, uh, congressional committees are now marking up uh, the budget. That is, mm -hmm. they take the president's budget and they say, well, we're, we're not going to give you all of this money. We're going to shift some over here. We're going to put conditions on the money. And Congress has wisely chosen to delay funding for the bases that the administration wants to build in Poland and the Czech Republic. So that's, that's part of what I'm recommending. They, they, they want to restore some accountability, see if these systems work before we go and, and deploy them. Um, for the others, like disband the Missile Defense Agency, that's something the, new, the next administration would have to do. I think we now have a uh, over 20-year history with uh, an agency devoted specifically to deploying missile defense systems. Uh, started by Ronald Reagan, now a full-fledged agency. I think that development and procurement experiment has failed. What we've created instead is a, a, a bureau of salesmen that go out and sell their product, whether they work or not, whether the threat is increasing or not, and it's a self-perpetuating money machine. It's time to take that institution apart and devolve the programs back to the services from whence they came. And this is part of what I mean by fiscal discipline. Let the chiefs, let the joint chiefs take the first cut at this. Let the chiefs help tell us whether they want to spend money on anti-ballistic missile systems or jets and ships and tanks. What do, where do they think the money should be going? I think historically when you do that, they make the right choices and they concentrate the resources on the defense capabilities we need, not a president's uh, pet rock. And finally, testing. I mean, this is the common sense rule. Fly before you buy. Let's see if these systems work. Can they pass an operational test that is a realistic test? Can they really shoot down an enemy missile? And if they can't, why on earth would we deploy them? What's the point? It's common sense. You state pretty baldly that, in fact, we've had some pretty misleading reports on the successes of these systems. In fact, they're not working yet, are they? They are not working yet. The, the so-called tests are more like demonstration shots. The threat is actually decreasing, not increasing. There mm -hmm. are fewer ballistic missiles in the world now than there were 20 years ago, fewer hostile countries with ballistic missiles, fewer countries with ballistic missile programs. When you look at the chart lines, you see the missile defense budgets going up like this, but the missile threat going down like this. It doesn't make any sense. Our, our money's out of whack with our threats. There's a pretty impressive um, bar graph and line graph in an yeah. article that you published in the May-June issue of Foreign uh, Policy. That, yeah. And in fact, the title of that article is The Incredible Shrinking Missile Threat. And the, the statistical graph shows that indeed spending goes up as uh, exactly contrary to the line that shows a threat going down. The editors of Foreign Policy told them if I gave them the data, they could make my argument in three seconds <laughs> with, <laughs> with a graph. So we spent a couple of days collecting all the data, and sure enough, they produced a chart that does make the point. Threat going down, money going up, something's not right here. It's a pretty impressive graphic illustration, I have to say. Would you speak ever so briefly about why the, the threat is actually shrinking right now? What is it in the, the state of the world that allows us to say that the threat is demonstrably lesser than it was? Well, the major thing is the end of the Cold War yeah. and the collapse of the, of the Soviet Union and the, and the sharp cuts in the, uh, the, the Russian missiles. And of the th potentially threatening missiles that still face us, 660 are held by Russia, by far the majority of the threat. China has about 20, and that's it. Now, we're talking not about missiles of any kind, long-range missiles that could hit the United States. There's a fewer number of those I in the world, but this is the, what the anti-missile program is aimed at. It's not about SCUDs, primarily. The missile deployments that we've put in Alaska, in California, what we're talking about in Poland and the Czech Republic, this is all long-range missiles. Aside from Russia and China, nobody else has them. So people have dropped out of the missile race. 
We're talking about North Korea struggling to, to bolt a couple of scuds on top of each other to see if they could hit the tip of Alaska. They failed. We're talking about Iran maybe someday, you know, having a missile that possibly could hit, could hit us. Their test program is in disarray. So when you look at the actual facts, when you look at the, you take the hype away and look at what people are actually doing, you realize it is very, very difficult to make a long-range missile. That's why so few countries have actually done it. That's why most countries drop out. And it's not even the major threat we face. If you're worried about a nuclear weapon hitting the United States, it's not going to come at us on the tip of a missile. It's going to come in a boat, a plane, a FedEx package. That's how terrorists would do it. You have a, a gift for plain speaking and a gift for a pithy sentence. Another sentence that I pulled out of that article in, um, in Foreign Policy is, quote, the truth is that diplomacy has destroyed far more missiles than interceptors ever will, unquote. Could we ask you to close by talking a little bit about your hope for the efforts of diplomacy in the next administration? Uh, Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush negotiated landmark nuclear arms reduction treaties that slashed the Soviet arsenals and the U.S. arsenals with them. We've seen a steady decline over the last 25 years as a result of these, of these treaties. We've sort of plateaued out. The current administration has rejected that negotiating approach uh, to our peril. I know that Russia's interested. I'm going to Moscow in a few weeks. I know that Russia's interested in steep reductions. We could go from thousands down to hundreds if we had a president with the, the, the vision and the courage to take up where previous presidents left off. I'm actually very optimistic that we're going to get such a president. I think the odds are right now that Barack Obama is probably going to be the next president of the United States. He's on record as being in favor of steep reductions of nuclear weapons and of establishing the goal for the elimination of nuclear weapons. Uh, I'm, I'm optimistic that we're at a turning point in U.S. nuclear policy where we can transform our own nuclear posture and in so doing transform the nuclear policies of the entire world. I'm very happy to be able to end on an optimistic note. Thank you very much for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. We've been speaking with visiting lecturer Joseph Cirincioni, president of the Plowshares Fund. Thank you for watching.